actually got recruited by the CIA while I was in the Army. I was in Fort Bliss, Texas. I was in the service there, missile radar. And Hello out there, everybody. Manny here at Area 503. And I hope you all have been well since our last video. Hey guys, today I got some clips from a recent interview that the alien scientist did with T.D. Barnes over on his channel. We are live. I am your host, Jeremy Riss. If you don't know who T.D. Barnes is, I will put a link to his biography in the description where you can get some more information about his qualifications. But just to keep it brief, TD worked out at Area 51 for close to two decades as a special projects manager. During his time at Area 51, TD worked on a variety of aircraft, including the A-12 ox cart and the study of captured Russian aircraft and their radar capabilities. Here's some clips from the show. First off, let, let's let's kind of just start off with you know your normal recruitment and how and, and how you got recruited into this um how you got the job out there yeah that's kind of an interesting story because you know that very good one didn't exist so it's hard to apply for a job that didn't exist i actually got recruited by the cia while i was in the army i was in fort bliss texas i was in the service there missile radar and, and uh, missiles well advanced in the field what's been about Two and a half years going, doing nothing, going to school, and then going to college at night. But anyway, I was way advanced, and they were getting ready to build the A-12 and test it out at Area 51, the spy plane. And the CIA got wind that the Russians had a tall, keen radar, a new radar, and they need to know its capability, whether it be able to uh, uh, detect the A-12 at time for the missile to shoot it down. Well, we knew that YouTube was going to eventually get shut down, shot down. And uh, uh, the Russians moved on to Cuba. And so they started flying ghost uh, flights. So um, it, it was so secret. So when you were first working on the project, you didn't even realize that you that, that this was a secret. Um, you thought it was the YF-12, and you didn't even know it was the A-12. Um, that, that's how secret this was on the base, right? And then it wasn't much later than that, uh, in 1965, I pr participated in the speed runs of the YF-12, but I was still with NASA at the time. So we knew um, we had the, the, the Blackbird. We didn't, still didn't know, know about the A-12. And I didn't know about it until I, uh, at, by its name until I went out there. But you know, we would, uh, there was occasions when the CIA would, would had me track the A-12 when they were certifying the different speeds as Lockheed was going through Mach 1, Mach 2, and Mach 3 trials. Uh, we had, at Beatty, we had a velocity recorder because we were tracking the X-15, the X-17, that sort of thing. So we had that capability. So I was the only one on at NASA that, that, that had a clearance for it. And CA would, they'd call me, we got something we want to track today and record its velocity. Of course, they didn't identify what it was, and um, because they didn't have a need to know. I, the um, when I was reading about the OPSEC of how they recruited the people and hired them into the project, they said there was thirty people um, that were hired into the into this project at Area Fifty One by the CIA, and um, you were all screened before for a job that didn't exist yet that you didn't know uh, existed, and that um, when you actually got the job, it turned out that fifteen of you had. Um, Boat, were boat guys who had a boat at Lake Mead, and then 15 of you had cabins at Mount Charleston. Yeah, so so that that was what the breakdown was. So they had specifically picked, you know, people that were would be buddy buddy, and you know they recruited the family. It wasn't just the guy. They they actually interviewed, the, the, checked out the the wives. The, the wife could get you disqualified for work at Dairy Kids one quicker than anything because they drank too much, they they yak too much. So they had to be the type of uh, families that could tolerate us being gone all week and not being able to tell them what where we were or what we were doing. So, what about um, vacation time? Did you guys work through Christmas, um, or were you you know at uh, out at Air, at Area Fifty One? 
so what was like the work schedule like that were you allowed to go out there and work continuously every you know month like every week uh with you know a couple weeks off a year what was what was it kind of like the uh, uh we, we could take vacation um and, and we and we did get the holidays off yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't that that regulated in the um it wasn't like they made, you know, they had you all out there testing stuff during Christmas because that's when everyone's home on holidays and no one, no one's going to yeah, be out there. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't plan any tests or anything during those, those periods. Do you think that Tic Tac is is a real craft, or do you think it's uh it, it's spoofing? I, I think it's fake iron. I think it's spoofing. Um, you were briefed into a lot of stuff about what was being tested out there, so. You probably you, that's why your first um, your first guess when you see these Nimitz encounters is saying that you, you're convinced that it's it's some it's some of our technology that's yeah, being just to repeat of what we were doing. Well, you know, it just makes sense that, that you would evaluate. Any, we always have it. any new system that comes on board, and and the thing is, the pilots and the different not only the people would need to know would even know the tests are going on. Chances are that when it's in those pilots, that they wouldn't know that they were, they they would, would wouldn't know what that they were going to be tested. Uh, you got interviewed by Tyler Rogaway and um, Brett Tingley on the Drive dot com, and you were, t you know, the whole they've they've put out a couple articles about this whole Nimitz encounters and stuff. I was wondering if you could comment and uh, talk about you know this a little bit more you think you seem to be on the, the side that these encounters that we're seeing are are, are our technology uh, absolutely so this is something and that's, you know we that, that's what we did with palladium and this almost parallels palladium except it's much advanced because with project palladium we didn't have computers yet so we didn't have the technology capability that we got today but um so I mean, why why do you think they're the Pentagon is you know pretending like these are you know UFOs, they're unidentified, when you know you you believe that this that they're they know that what what these things are. That's true. The Pentagon never going to admit anything. That's the way we always worked. We had a cover for everything, and so there's no, you know, anyone, everybody's expecting this Senate report to have, you know, to give the answer. So there's, you know, this stuff is so secret that there's just no way this will be published. Uh, so, and I'm sure that the, the military and the Pentagon are embarrassed that the tape was leaked. It caused an un, unwanted attention to something that we've been doing for 50 years. Uh, if you go on Google um, Earth, I'm sure a lot of people have done this and, and searched around the vicinity of Area 51, especially in the area like Dogbone Dry Lake. There's a uh, there's like these makeshift cities. Uh, are those like you know set up like cities that are you know built to to, to do these kind of test runs and bombing missions or what what are those for on the map? I always see them out there. Area 51 is no longer Area 51. In, in the sense of way it was, uh, when we were there, it was 60, 60 square mile block box out there. The Air Force tank took it over. Now it is part of the uh, gunner, the Nellis Gunners Range. It's nine million acres. Mm. It still got a, a no fly zone, and you know, in it, in it, but it is. No, they don't even refer to it now as Area Fifty One. Mm. It's, uh, it's it's homey airport. Homey Airport? Homey, yeah. Homey was our code name for Area 51 with the pilot back then in it. And they that's and now it's registered with the UF you look on your FAA maps and everything. It's registered as a uh, homey airport.
have you ever heard of or been to a facility or, or a place called S S4 or Site 4? How long were you employed at S4 and when were you hired? When was I hired at S4? I guess early 89 and I was probably there only about six months or so. There was no absolutely no ET craft, ET technology, anything like that at Area 51. This is why S4 was made specifically to separate it there. People at Area 51 do not have the clearance. Uh, I haven't been to, I know what it is. Site 4 is where we uh, set up our Russian radar. It, we, got, we put an airstrip in there and it would, became a center for Russian radar uh, for red flag and that sort of thing. And uh, I've read, you know, where uh, Lazar claimed that it was Papu. There's nothing at Papu's Lake. Absolutely. We had a microwave tower and that was it. Site 4 was a different direction. But we had a Site 4, yes. Have you seen the uh, the photos of Papu's Lake that um, we're, we we uh, we got recently? They were taken by a pilot named Gabe Zeifman who flew over there, uh, flew over it, and uh, took some photos of it. I'm going to pull them up on the screen. Um, so you don't think that there's any way that they could have hidden a base inside this little mountain side here? No, and and we we didn't have that, that kind of activity going on uh, back then. But uh, would no, they have a need? Would they have a need for another secret, uh, more secret facility than Area Fifty One, or was the security at Area Fifty One already sufficient? It was it was sufficient. Uh, and, and what we didn't want people to see at Area 51, we, we moved it to a Tonopal test range. The Russians knew we were there, and and particularly when we started flying their MiGs out there. And uh, so we didn't want them to know how many MiGs we had, whatever. So we actually moved the squadron to um, uh, Tonopal, and, uh, as well as the F-117s. They shared the same uh, airstrip. I had a hangar on each end. So we had other sites that something really, really super sensitive. We could move them uh, out of where the Russians were looking because they'd be looking at us. What do you think would have happened to you if um, you had left work and, and gone down to uh, John Lear's driveway and gotten interviewed with uh, George Knapp on KLAS and uh, and spilled some scientific secrets about what was going on inside the base? Uh, uh, there's really no way I can prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than I have already. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin and uh, they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of, of completion built from other parts and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. Uh, I've certainly lost my clearance for sure. <laughs> that is, uh, that's the worst thing. And of course, in our profession, you lose your security clearance. That means you, uh, in, that's the end of your career. Uh, uh, but that's all that never entered any of our minds, you know, something like that. We didn't even talk to each other, other than um, on a need to know. Um, to kind of give you a, your ears of idea on this. There was 30 in my group, special projects group. We were, and we were working for the CIA Science and Technology. We were all contractors. And we all had different specialties. And after Oxcart moved out, you know, up to one point, the only thing on the side was the uh, first was the U-2, and then later it was the A-12 project uh, Oxcart. And they, but once we got the MiGs in, that changed the whole, whole ball game. The SR uh, A-12 guys that's still on the side couldn't even come in our building because we had we were working on the stealth and we were working on the um, um, on the MiGs, and then it got later on it got where we had other customers. Uh, this is actually we quit flying the A-12 and U-2s out of there. And uh, there'd be a point where even if we'd been my group, uh, you would, we didn't ask, what are you working on or who are you doing it for or how does it work? We knew basically what each other was doing. If you need a, need a help with something, you'd say, hey, Joe, come give me a hand with this. But you didn't ask, who are you doing this for? Or what is it? How, what, you know, how does it work? Like, you just didn't ask. And you would be highly offended if someone had, had asked you that too.
people are asking about the models up in your background and <laughs> behind you on the shelf and uh that's all, all the stuff I worked on. I've worked on every one of those. It's the F-15, the lifting body that became the space shuttle, the MiGs. Then, of course, of course I got my Hawk missile and my Hercules. I made Nike Hercules missiles back there. But yeah, every one of those uh, I got to work on. That's awesome. So you never worked on any sport models? When I was let in, it was the first time I saw the sport model in the hangar sitting down and... Uh, I was told they could have walked me in the front door, but they purposely wanted to walk me by it. I was told not to say anything and just keep my eyes forward and, and walk past the disc into the office area. I don't see I don't see any uh, sport no. model behind. No, we didn't work on the sport model. <laughs> they don't got any uh, no uh, saucers they're testing out out there at the base at all. No, we didn't know. We had, this is uh, get me in trouble, but we called a lot of our proof of concept. Um, like the bird of prey and the in the attack it blue and some of those we call them platforms which was um, at the time no one knew about it the ufo the ufo thing didn't start until 1969 1980 when the cia had to turn area one over to the air force that's when the word got out that the, that the cia had been operating for 20 years at this place out in the desert in nevada and everybody wondered what in the world had they been doing for 20 years. And that's when the story started with the Roswell and all of that. For 20 years, no one knew what we were doing. But it's only when the Air Force, and that's the reason the CIA had to, had to start with, it, they could keep the secret, the Air Force couldn't. So, George, that Area 51 would be the worst place in the world for, for the thing that the Lazar different ones would claim was going on out there. Because you had all the transit people going in and out, carpenters and guys working on the runway and all that kind of stuff, and and um, the cooks and uh, uh, and so and and various contractors. No way you could have kept secret. Plus, you had uh, the Russians had these satellites coming over uh, regularly. They were spying on us out there. So that would be the worst place in the world. And I, as I told George, the best place. What I would do. With a secret program like that is find some little island out in the middle of Mississippi River someplace and call it a mad cow disease research or something or other. Have big old signs yeah. on the doors there. Hide in plain sight is the point. Hide it in plain sight and everybody would say, hey, they, 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 they tested something out there, you know. And that, and, but Area 51 was, was so um, monitored, put it that way. That had been almost impossible, and plus, knowing how security worked out there, there's no one anyone could have worked out there, and it be not known. It just didn't work that way. Yeah, I can't. I can't go into a lot of detail like that, but I don't care if you're the four-star general or congressman, you could not just walk into Area 51. Period. Do you think that Bob Lazar was us playing a game on the Russians? Do you think that maybe that he was like brought out and shown some bunch of crap just to like throw the throw them off? I've never been able to figure Bob out where he got caught up into this. He, um, he was a very smart individual, from what I can tell. And uh, but there's others. We we even had guys that, at, particularly as he got older, that would start making claims that were just out of this world, and they knew better. It, I think it was. Whether you didn't see now or what. And the thing is, and this might be beneficial to your listeners, is uh, these proof of concept things, that, uh, different models. Well, say Boeing is competing with Lockheed. Well, Boeing at, uh, up in Seattle would build their prototype and test it on their range. Lockheed would have their whatever they were going to test and be testing it down in Burbank or where, wherever. And it didn't, then they would bring it out to Area 51, and that's when, that was part of the big secret too, because Lockheed wouldn't want uh, Boeing to know what they were testing, vice versa. So that's one thing that we did not talk shop about each other. You know, we didn't tell tales on what we just got through testing. But, that, but that they were our customers, and then the Navy or whoever was going to buy this would come in, and they were a customer. We had two customers out there, the buyer and the, and the seller, but we had the equipment and, and, and the technology, the technical people, to show us what you got. 
And that's what we'd do. They would put it through the paces with our equipment and stuff that we had all over radar, data processing and whatever. Uh, and then we would hand it over to the customer. Here's what, here's what they got. And uh, a lot of the testing that went on out there, uh, I'll give you an example with the, the MIG program. Now we were, uh, had, you know, we put our MIGs up against the, the Army, I mean, the Air Force and the Navy. And for example, uh, when the, the uh, Air Force wanted to test their F-84s, they had a couple of National Guard pilots up in New Jersey fly down. They didn't tell them this one, there it's one. They just told me we got a classified mission. You're going to go up against a foreign aircraft at Nellis Air Force Base. And they actually flew, did the test over Area 51, but those pilots never knew it. They never knew they was over Area 51. So is there one contractor out at Area 51, or is there multiple contractors? Because, you know, I kind of want to, you mentioned that, like, it's the CIA running the show out there, they're the main, you know, boss. But you have you worked for different contractors or different groups. You do you were sometimes you weren't even sure who who specifically you were working for. Just that they were briefed into the project and, and cleared to be your manager. Talk about that that a little bit. And um, I know EG and G is the main contractor out there, but they're not the only one. So. No, uh, we they EG and G carried us on their payroll uh, most of the time. Uh, there was a period out there when we would actually run out of projects. And they would loan us out to atomic bomb tests for until they got some funds in for the, for the next project. So we, we called it the black world of the white world. And so I got participated in, I think it's five atomic bomb tests. And, and uh, before then, I would, once we got the funds in or whatever, then I disappeared back into the black world. So we got to do a lot of things that uh, you normally wouldn't expect. But in those instances, we would be hidden up on someone else's payroll. A select, but you had what, we, as you talk about contractors, um, we had multiple contractors but they, they, for projects. They come in and they come and go. And that's another thing that shoots down the bazaar and, and people's stories on this. Cause no one, the only permanent people out there was the CIA communications people, the people that, for the mess hall and, and that sort of thing, and my group. All the rest were customers. And they would come in and, and we would service them. And they might be there just for, like the MIG program. And they'd come in for a month flying um, um, maybe the MIG-17, and then they would never see them again. So the so contractors come and go. The food uh, at Area 51 was uh, some of the best food you've ever had. Uh, Absolutely the best. Everybody will say that. The CIA made sure that we had the best uh, food in the world. I mean, uh, I'm sure that a lot of your people have heard of the Aurora, and yeah. you know they seen seen it. Well, one I'll tell you what the Aurora was. Now we were we had a proof of concept uh, plane that we were testing out there. It never had a name, and it was seen at the same time. Uh, people had found some appropriation records or a lot of money been appropriated for a project named, named Aurora. And they said, aha, that's what's flying out of Area 51. That's, here's the money for it. Aurora, during the B-2 bomber, uh, uh, when they were building it, they went way, way, way over budget. And the only way they could get the money to finish the B-2 bomber was to generate a fictitious project and get it appropriated through Congress. And that was Project Aurora. That was for the B-2 bomber. So that whole thing was fictitious. So uh, that was... Because that, that started all kinds of rumors that it was a whole other project, and that's what... I you was seeing stuff, and it put, put two and two together. So was, now, this is another reason so, no one knew about what the CIA was doing, is we did not have to go to Congress to get our money. We were unvouchered. We did not have to account for our money. So, in your opinion, do you think uh, do you think we're alone in the universe, or are we being visited? You ever heard of a guy named uh, Mike Thigpen? These foggles. Have you ever heard of the the these another layer of opsec thing? I, I heard about was these goggles that they made you wear, which limited your your vision, your sight. What about the ID badges and um, hand, hand scanners? Did you do you remember them having hand scanners when you went out into the facility or uh, ID badges and? 
So this gets me into my next, the, the next thing I want to talk about, which is, have you ever heard of a guy named Edgar Fouché? I was wondering if you had ever heard of any kind of experiments being done with, you know, on anti-gravity. It was a lot of SR-71 pilots that were also recruited to, you know, uh, fly experimental test planes as well, right? That's the kind of people that they would recruit generally. Or this. So one of the questions people had is, why should we believe you, uh, TD? How do we know that you're you're you know you're not um, you know working for the government to cover up the truth about Bob Lazar? So um, you're allowed to talk about Project Idealist, ox cart, have drill, have ferry, have donut. Yeah, they've been declassified. So someone told me there's a museum out there with um, one of everything they've built out there. Oh, uh, Alfred C. Loading and like uh, another company out of uh, Avro Car. They they built a lot of saucer shaped. You know, this guy worked for Wright at Wright Patterson, of course. So I know that they they built a lot of these saucer shaped um, aircraft and everything. It, do you, do you know of any kind of any kind of testing that was done at Area 51. I know that Area 51 was picked as a test site, um, but but there are, it's not the only place experimental aircraft are tested, correct? I had a question um, from the audience. Do you believe that Roswell was uh, Project Mogul, or do you think uh, that it was... Um... So Area 51 didn't exist until 1955, so let's just say that the Air Force had captured a Horton Brothers parabola for example um post world war ii uh, where would where do you think that they, that would have been brought in and, and stored and so i've i've been on this side that i i too believe that those nimitz encounters um were quite possibly our technology being tested um and i've even spoken to a number of the pilots like uh tim mcshillen i mean mcmillan and um and others um and i was wondering if you what would you say to those pilots who insist that these things were not our technology there think that bob lazar was us playing a game on the russians do you think that maybe that he was like brought out and shown some bunch of crap just to like throw the throw them off again what happened to those people that blew the gate at area 51 and yeah. drove into the place so um what do you say to those people that 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh man that was just a you, what about the earliest Foo Fighters sighting in World War II is like 1942 or something? Do you think oh, we had no. what? What do you think that was? Or I, yeah, I, you're not a trained counter, and you've never been trained as a counterintelligence uh, operative. You don't work, and you never worked in counterintelligence. Your expertise in the military was uh, was missiles and EC, ECMs and ECCMs and and all this yeah, I'm stuff. Electron, I'm, an, I'm an electronic nerd. Yeah, he's an electronics nerd. So yeah, again, he's not a wordsmith and, and, a, and a master mind manipulator like some of these other guys. He's a nicely put this and that control and they're flying and with so impunity. There is <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, man. This was uh, this was an awesome awesome interview, man. Uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time with uh, us and my audience and getting these questions addressed and answered in detail. That's been our mission to get the word out to, of the legacy of, of what we did because it's it's important. So yeah, it was an amazing interview, and I will leave a link to the full interview in the description below over on the Alien Scientists channel. If you haven't gotten a chance yet, head on over there and check out the work that Jeremy and all of his friends are doing on alternative propulsion and the study of UFO propulsion in general. Well guys, for now, that's all that I've got on the Alien Scientist and T.D. Barnes. I'll catch y'all later. As always, this has been Manny at Area 503. And I wish you all the best until we meet again. And I am out of here to continue my search for universal truth. You know something you, that your listener might be interested in, why did they pick Area 51?